hello and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel hope everyone is doing well today i have four true ghost stories from the haunted canada series if i pronounce anything wrong i do apologize the blue ghost tunnel thorold ontario there lies an old stone tunnel in the woods of thorold it's crumbling, dark and dangerous, abandoned, remote and difficult to find. Many people, even with detailed directions, become turned around and never find it. That's probably for the best. Something dwells in the darkness, something that becomes violent and angry when disturbed. The tales told by those who have reached the tunnel should be enough to deter others from seeking it out. A young man named Justin explored it with a friend before Halloween one year. They were both armed with a brand new flashlight and freshly charged batteries, but still felt a deep sense of dread as soon as they approached the tunnel's wide, gaping mouth. Inside the tunnel was so dark, they couldn't see their hands before their faces. So they decided to turn on their flashlights. Only one would work. Justin was left quite literally in the dark, all too reliant upon his friend's light to see. They heard voices coming from the deep, so the friend went farther in to investigate. Justin waited anxiously behind. He tried not to think of the suffocating blackness that surrounded him like a cloud of smoke. The only sound he could hear was a drip, drip, drip of water falling from the tunnel's roof. He faced the direction his friend had left and saw an approaching light. But just then his friend appeared, not in front of him, but at his side. The friend had walked the length of the tunnel and no one was there. So who or what was holding the light they could see? Before much longer, the light disappeared. That was enough to force them out of the tunnel. Standing outside the entrance, regretting their decision to venture into the tunnel at all, they suddenly heard a piercing scream echo from within. Justin took the flashlight from his friend, pointed at the darkness, and turned it on. But the light that had worked moments ago faded out. Their courage faded away too. They left immediately without exploring any further, putting as much distance between them and the tunnel as possible. Sometime later, a woman named Lori entered the tunnel with a group of friends, hoping for a bit of a thrill. She found more than she had hoped for. Deep in the tunnel, the group stopped and silently waited for something to happen. Without warning, a small hand grabbed Lori's and pulled her from behind. Which one of you did that? She asked her friends. But no one was close enough to have touched her. Just then, her other hand was yanked by something in the shadows. Help! A small child's voice whispered in her ear. Lori wasn't the only one to hear the ghostly plea. Her friends heard it too. They all began to feel oddly exhausted and wearily left the tunnel. The next day, many of the group were physically ill, as if they'd somehow been infected by the tunnel's air. A man named Mark has trekked into the tunnel many times over the years and had a few creepy encounters, including hearing whispers from the walls and a woman crying. Those haunting sounds weren't enough to keep him away permanently. But one night, when exploring with a friend, he had such a terrifying encounter that he hasn't been back since. Mark and his friends split up to explore opposite ends of the tunnel. Walking slowly in silence, Mark came to a low wooden beam. He ducked to pass below it, and when he stood up on the other side, he was immediately confronted by an angry spirit that moved toward him. The ghost was an old man in outdated clothing. His face was twisted with rage, and he pointed his cane threateningly at Mark. The moment the spirit was close enough to strike, he vanished. Then came a loud thump and the sound of footsteps running in the opposite direction. Mark's friend returned and confirmed he had heard the bang and the footsteps. Mark was shaking badly and was absolutely petrified. He had felt the man's anger and hate radiating off his dead body in waves. He somehow knew the ghost was mad at the intrusion and was trying to protect the tunnel. Originally called the Marathon Tunnel, it was built in the mid-1870s to provide passage beneath a canal for trains of the Great Western Railway. But the construction was plagued by many serious injuries and three reported deaths. One such tragedy occurred when some of the heavy limestone rocks used to create the tunnel's walls fell on top of a 14-year-old Irish immigrant, crushing him to death. 
the Welland Canal construction project, which was being completed at the same time, also resulted in several fatalities, many of which occurred directly above the Marathon Tunnel site. The further expansion of the canal system in the 1920s required that an old abandoned church be demolished and the skeletal inhabitants of the cemetery be moved to create a reservoir. There were 913 graves in the cemetery, but it's estimated only 250 were actually located and moved, leaving 663 corpses at the bottom of the water located very close at the tunnel's entrance. As if that weren't enough, there was also a horrible head-on collision between two trains near the western entrance of the tunnel on January 3, 1902. The collision claimed the lives of each of the train's firemen. Abraham DeSalt received burns to 90% of his body and was rushed to St. Catherine's General Hospital, where he died five hours after the accident. Charles Horning was killed instantly. His body was crushed and mangled between the boiler and a large piece of ironwork. A mere 11 years after it had been completed, the tunnel was deemed too dangerous for frequent passage and converted to occasional use. Then, in 1915, it was closed completely. Without the passage of trains, it became a ghost tunnel, both figuratively and literally. But where did it get its present-day nickname, the Blue Ghost Tunnel? In 1999, a teenager named Russ heard rumors about the tunnel's haunted history from a friend. Russ had started a website that listed haunted locations in the Niagara Falls region and decided to visit the Marathon Tunnel to see for himself if anything sinister dwelled within. With the company of three friends, safely, they hoped in numbers, Russ approached the tunnel's entrance. The members of the group suddenly felt dizzy as if electrical currents were surging through their bodies. It seemed like something was trying to keep them away. Before they decided whether to enter the tunnel or leave, an icy blue fog-like apparition materialized in front of them. The entity shifted in form, first a screaming face, then a human body, next a wolf, and finally a demon. It blocked their path for 15 long seconds before disappearing. Despite the fact that they had visited the tunnel to see a ghost, they admitted to being overcome by fear. No one could find the courage to enter. They agreed that the blue ghost they had all seen was guarding the entrance and would not allow them to enter without terrible consequences. When Russ reported his petrifying confrontation online, the Blue Ghost Tunnel's notary grew exponentially. Despite the tunnel's sinister reputation, or maybe because of it, people keep visiting it in the middle of the night. Most of the time, they see or hear something horrifying, and more often than not, they run away as quickly as possible, never to return. <clears throat> Isle of Demons, Corpon Island, Newfoundland, and Labrador. The year was 1544, and Marguerite de la Roque gripped an old chipped sword in her hand. The doll blade was her last line of defense against the pack of wolves that closed in on all sides. She sliced the air between them with the sword and screamed at the wild animals. The wolves answered with howls and snarls. Their lips pulled back and their hackles raised. Wind whipped Marguerite's long, tangled hair across her weathered and gaunt face. At her heels were the recently covered graves of her boyfriend, her lady servant, and, most heartbreakingly, her newborn son. The wolves were mad with hunger. There was little to eat on the island, and they wanted what was in those graves. In the bone-chillingly cold, bone chillingly cold night on the uninhabited isle of demons, dressed in skins of bears she herself had killed and skinned, Marguerite was virtually indistinguishable from the beasts that closed in on her. She had become a wild animal herself. Had anyone seen her at that moment, it would have been impossible to believe that. Only two years before, she had been part of France's high society, a woman of distinguished birth and wealth. How Marguerite came to be marooned 
on an island, teeming with dangerous animals, demons, and evil spirits, fighting for her life is a tragic story. It's so far-fetched it seems like fantasy, but truth is often stranger than fiction. In the summer of 1542, Marguerite was accompanying her uncle, Jean-Francois de la Roquet de Roberville, on a ship full of passengers from France to colonize the Canadian wilderness. Among the other passengers willing to make the voyage and start a new life was Etne Gosselin, the son of a notary who had a passion for the sea. That made him want nothing more than to be a shipbuilder. Hair, fair-haired and pale, young Marguerite had led the sheltered life as a French maiden and was instantly attracted to Etne when they went aboard the ship. Etne, with curly hair and eyes of blue as the sea, entertained the ship's passengers by playing his zither, a stringed instrument, when he sang a long and romantic song that he had written about Marguerite. <coughs> <clears throat> written about Marguerite, their relationship and fate were both sealed, but neither would have a happy ending. They began courting in secret. Her servant, Damien, was the only other person who was aware of their relationship. Secrets, however, are as hard to hide on a ship as an elephant in a small room. Jean-Francois soon found out he felt betrayed and hurt. And as a God-fearing man, he believed that the secret union would anger the Lord. He kept both his rage and fear hidden. Biding his time before acting against his niece in a cold and calculated fashion. As Marguerite's legal guardian, financially strapped, Jean-Francois had nothing to gain. Should, he marry, should, he, should she marry Etne and everything to lose? On the other hand, if Marguerite were to die... Not by Jean-Francois hands, of course. Before a wedding could take place, Jean-Francois would inherit a large sum of money. Long days passed. The ship arrived in Canada and sailed along the coast of Newfoundland. Jean-Francois leaned against the railing and stared at the lands they passed. And then he spotted what he had been looking for, the Isle of Demons. This legendary land, believed to be located in present-day Corpon Island, first appeared on maps in 1508 and was found on nautical charts until the mid-17th century. It was populated by so many demons and ghosts that passing ships gave the island a wide berth and the few hardened men who went ashore did so with the crucifixes, clutched tightly in their shaking hands. The apparitions that haunted the island were the tortured souls who had drowned in the Atlantic Ocean. They were reported to make terrible noises while leading the living astray. Fierce carnivores like bears and wolves roamed the land, and the winters were colder than cold. It was not a place for any human could live. Jean-Francois's plan was to maroon his niece on the Isle of Demons as punishment for her sins. <clears throat> Under the guise of allowing God to determine her fate, but it was nothing short of a death sentence. Without hesitation, he informed his crew of this decision and ordered his niece to leave the ship immediately, along with Damien, for her part in the conspiracy. He left them some rifles and supplies and then, ignoring her pleas, set sail without pause so that no one would have time to take pity on Marguerite and try to rescue her. When Etne discovered what was happening. He rushed to the deck with his own loaded rifle and, instant, and insisted that he be allowed to join Marguerite and Damien. Jean-Francois had intended to maroon him later on a different island, but decided to grant him his foolish wish. He had some men from his crew ferry Etne to the island in a small boat with further supplies and taunted the young couple as the ship sailed away. Once the ship and her uncle had disappeared over the horizon, Marguerite, Etne, and Damien quickly got to work. For shelter, they built a crude wooden hut near a cavern. They hunted small animals and searched for berries and herbs they could eat. There were no other people on the island, just rocks, sand, and deep forests. But for a while, it seemed like they'd be okay. Hopefully, they'd be able to survive long enough for another ship to pass by, then night fell. 
and with the night came the creatures. The wind carried supernatural voices so loud and threatening that it seemed to be seemed to the terrified trio that there were more than one hundred thousand angry men approaching. Ghosts fitted in and out of the fog that ensnared their hut like a heavy blanket. Red eyes peered in at them through gaps in the wood, and hands and claws, both human and animal, tried to pry the boards apart. The voices laughed and howled and cackled, and the shapes of the demons and apparitions besieging them shifted and morphed before their eyes. Nearly faint with fear, Marguerite, Etne, and Damien repented their sins and read aloud from the Bible. Miraculously, this was enough to diminish the attacks. Although the creatures didn't leave them alone for long, as the days passed, they had to remain vigilant to protect themselves against the evil shades that were hidden in every dark corner of the island and grew, af- and grew active after nightfall. Days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, yet no rescue party came for- to their salvation. Ships did pass but quickly fled from the sight of people waving their arms and sending smoke into the sky. People who looked less human by the day. With a sickening feeling, Margaret realized that from the water, they must look exactly like the creatures and ghosts that kept sailors away from the Isle of Demons. As time passed, she became an expert hunter. One day she killed three bears herself. Their furs provided much-needed warmth against the winter. Marguerite also soon discovered a source of happiness among the misery of their marooning. She was pregnant. The joy she felt from the thought of being a mother was like everything else that had been good in her life. Short-lived. When Margaret was near term, Etne drank, oh, Etne drank contaminated water, became ill, and died. With a heavy heart, Marguerite buried him as deep as she could, but the creatures and wild animals came that night for his body. She took up post and fended them off. It was an exhausting, frightening, and stressful task she'd have to repeat night after night. Soon her baby was born, a healthy boy that Marguerite baptized. She had little, she had little time to celebrate or relax. She took up Etne's rifle and sword and became a warrior, fighting back against the creatures who doubled their frenzied attacks after the baby was born. Sixteen months after being marooned, Damien died. Shortly thereafter, the unthinkable happened. The baby followed the same path as the servant women and Etne. Marguerite was alone with her grief. The creatures seemed to sense her mental weakness and increased their assaults once again, even launching attacks during the day. Marguerite dropped her face into her palms to cry and pray, but between her fingers she could see the beast dancing around her. Her gunpowder gunpowder was ruined by dampness and age, and she had, and she was left with Etne's dull sword as her last line of defense. She now had three graves to protect. Fortunately, her luck was about to turn. In the fall of 1544, more than two years after her uncle had left her on the Isle of Demons to die, ships commanded by cod fishermen from Brittany appeared on the horizon. Marguerite called to them from the shore. Although they did not intentionally believe she was human, they sailed closer for a better look and realized she was not one of the fabled creatures known to inhabit the island. A team of men came ashore and Marguerite was grateful for their arrival. She showed them where she had lived and shared her sad story. And the men could scarcely believe this young, small, wild-looking woman has survived... for so long in those conditions. After packing her few meager but prized possessions, including Etne's zither, she erected a cross before the three graves she had guarded so fiercely. Stepping foot on one of the fisherman's boots was an out-of-body experience. And as she watched the Isle of Demons fade away, Marguerite was suddenly overcome by sorrow and the madness of what she had endured. She tried to jump off the ship and swim back to the island, to die with those she held so dear. The fishermen restrained her before she could act so rashly and settling aside their work in order to take her straight back to France, set out 
east across the Atlantic. Back in her home country, Marguerite became a schoolmistress and never sought justice against her uncle, who died during a riot some years later. She devoted the rest of her life to shaping young minds and spreading the word of God, sharing her courageous and remarkable story as an example of his mercy. Once Marguerite's tale became widely known, the Isle of Demons and the surrounding islands were renamed the Isles de la Demoiselle in her honor. But don't let the name fool you. Fishermen today still report hearing unearthly howls carried on the wind from the island and have seen two ghosts walking in its shores walking its shores a man playing a zither and a young woman dressed in bearskins forever defending themselves from the evil creatures and apparitions that lurk in the woods the island may no longer be so demonic in name but it certainly is in spirit Step into the cold Montreal, Quebec. Built in 1725, La Maison Pierre de Calvet is the oldest historical house in Montreal that now operates as a hotel. Stepping onto the stone building is like stepping through a gateway that transports you 300 years in the past. Below your feet, Moroccan rugs from wall to wall above your head, blood red beam ceilings. All around you, antique furniture, wall tapestries, crackling fireplaces, and swaths of velvet and satin framing that shuttered casement windows. Behind your back, shadows skulking in the dark. The Pierre de Cavelt looks like a medieval castle, and like all true castles, it's haunted by the past. Some guests have learned that the hard way. Enchanted by its elegant beauty and decor, One woman checked in for five nights. The concierge assigned her to room three and wished her a pleasant night, but that night would be anything but pleasant. Early the next morning, the woman returned to the front desk. Her hair was disheveled, dark rings lined her eyes, and she dragged her packed suitcase across the floor behind her. She looked like she hadn't slept a wink. Turns out she hadn't. When the concierge asked how he could help her, The woman replied that he could check her out of the hotel then and there. She would not be spending one more night in the Pierre du Calvelt. When asked what was the matter with her room, (coughs) when asked what was the matter with her room, the woman replied that it wasn't the room per se that was the trouble, but rather the spirit haunting it. A woman in an old-fashioned dress had spent the entire night sitting on the bed beside her. The guest was too terrified to remove the bed. Or the guest was too terrified to move and didn't dare fall asleep for fear of what might happen if she let her guard down. The ghost didn't say anything threatening and didn't touch her, but she had an evil air about her, like she resented the intrusion of the living guest in the room, like she was coldly calculating that she should do. La Maison Père de Cavelt's namesake and previous owner was born in France and sailed to Quebec in 1758 to become a merchant in the New World. But he lost all of his merchandise in a shipwreck. Upon his arrival, as great a setback as the accident was, it was significantly less tragic than a second shipwreck in 1786, which claimed Pierre de Cavelt's life at sea. Between shipwrecks, Du Calvet worked hard to reestablish his inventory and become a storekeeper, was appointed as Justice of the Peace for Montreal, and as a notorious sympathizer of the American Revolution, welcomed Benjamin Franklin and countless other famous guests to his home. He led an active, busy life, but he also found time to start a family. When he married Mary Louise Dussemé in October 1773, Together they had three sons, but only one survived. Their marriage similarly was disdained not to last, or was 
Their marriage, similarly, was destined not to last. Mary Louise died three years after their wedding. The cause of her death was mysterious and unknown. The hallmarks of a restless spirit with unfinished business. Rumors swirled around Montreal claiming that Marie Louise got along well, too well with her husband's male guests who stayed overnight in their home. These accusations found their way to Du Cavalt's ear and infected his mind like maggots wriggling in his brain. Some believe that his jealousy blackened his soul and in a fit of rage he murdered his young wife for her accused sins. He was never charged for playing any part in Marie Louise's death. However, and the truth was lost when a Spanish ship sailing from New York to England sank during a violent gale, claiming the lives of Du Calvet and everyone else on, a, on board. These days, Mary Louise remains in her former home, keeping one eye on the female guests and the other on the males. Men staying in the hotel have seen her ghost step from the shadows to smile at them with a wink, while Mary Louise gives women the literal cold shoulder, or in the case of Kat, a woman from New York who spent a night in 2013, a cold hand. Early in the morning, while lying in bed, Kat was awoken when the ghost appeared and grabbed her arm. Kat was unable to move, open her eyes, or even scream out in terror. For some inexplicable reason, she was forced to lie as still as a statue throughout the terrifying ordeal. After an uncertain length of time, Kat was finally able to kick her legs and break free from the ghost grasp. She opened her eyes, but Mary Louise had disappeared. The staff at the hotel have also witnessed bizarre things and felt an angry presence in the, room, in the rooms and halls. One day, a maid finished making a bed and stepped out of the room for a moment. When she returned, the sheets that had been pulled tight and tucked under the mattress were ruffled and there was an indent as a person was lying in the middle of the bed. A man who worked in the hotel's restaurant felt Mary Louise's presence on nights when he was cleaning alone. At first the spirit seemed pleasant enough and he tried to ignore it, unaware that he did so at his own peril. For the ghost demanded attention and he began to feel that her presence was becoming menacing. Eventually, the unseen company of the ghost became too oppressive for him to carry on with his closing duties, so he screamed at the top of his lungs for her to go away and leave him alone. Apparently, Mary Louise finally got the message and backed off, leaving him in peace from that day forward. On the main floor is a greenhouse conservatory that is home to many exotic birds, including two parrots named pa Pedro and Chico. These two characters enjoy the company of both hotel staff and guests and welcome everyone who enters the room with a chipper, hello, hello. Their greeting is a friendly sound and never fails to warm the, warm the hearts of those who hear it. Except, of course, when the room is empty and Pedro and Chico can be heard welcoming someone unseen into their greenhouse. It's believed animals are more highly attuned to the spirits of the departed and the hotel's employees make sure to give the greenhouse a wide berth when they hear the parrots talking to an empty room. It seems the hotel's owners aren't merely being poetic when they issue the following welcome to prospective guests. Take a route for a few days. Be filled with wonder. Take part in our history. How much history you wish to take part in is entirely up to you. Red as Blood, Vancouver, British Columbia. They'd had a long flight, and the young couple visiting from Japan were eager to check into the Fairmont Hotel, Vancouver. Little did they know that the floor their room was located on, the 14th, is known to be a hotbed of paranormal activity. Nothing seemed amiss as they exited the elevator and walked to their room. They unlocked the door and stepped inside, ready to crawl into bed and sleep off their jet lag. But much to their surprise, the room was already occupied. There was a lady in a luxurious red dress sitting on the edge of the bed. She said nothing and made no action to leave. She just sat and stared. Assuming an innocent mistake had been made and the room was double booked, the husband and wife apologized. 
and backed out of the room. They went to the front desk and reported what had happened, but hotel staff could could find no record of anyone else being checked into the same room. What did this woman look like? The hotel employer asked. The couple described a beautiful young woman in her 20s wearing a bright red dress, red as blood. She appeared ready for a fancy ball. That was exactly what the employee expected to hear. The woman in the couple's room was no living guest, but a ghost, the Hotel Vancouver's infamous lady in red. After a series of stalled attempts to complete its construction, the Hotel Vancouver, affectionately known as the Hotel Van, was finally completed and opened to the public in 1939. It was a time of excitement and prosperity. The Great Depression was over and the city of Vancouver was abuzz. The official opening of the Chateau-style hotel was attended by Britain's King George The official opening of the Chateau style hotel was attended by Britain's King George VI, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, and the first of many Christmas balls was held by year's end in the elegant Pacific ballroom. Brightly lit and decorated pine trees filled the interior of the hotel, while imposing Gothic gargoyles stood guard on the copper roof outside the hotel van's annual Christmas ball, became a staple of the season. Beloved by the city's well-to-do citizens, but the party, and indeed the very hotel itself, was adored by no one more than Jen- Jenny Pearl Cox. With her husband Harold and their six-year-old daughter Dottie, Jenny strode into the hotel van's lobby for the inaugural Christmas ball and immediately fell in love. The family checked into a room, and Harold and Dottie dressed in their finest but their breath was stolen when they laid eyes on Jenny in her stunning red dress it was a dress so perfectly suited both for the season and for Jenny that she wore it to each Christmas ball for the next four years in fact she's decided to wear it for eternity in the summer of 1944 Jenny, Harold and Dottie were returning to the city from a relaxing countryside picnic The sun glistened in the city's windows under a brilliant blue sky. The tragedy that was barreling toward the happy family in the form of a delivery truck was a complete contradiction to their moods. The truck rounded a corner and Harold saw it too. It struck their car with a sickening crunch. Metal squealed and glass shattered. There were no survivors. Coincidentally, Jenny and her family died on the street in front of her favorite place in the world, the hotel where they had celebrated Christmas for the past five years. Following her far too earthly death, it gradually became apparent that Jenny couldn't bring herself to leave the hotel behind. She is regularly seen in her red dress gliding along the 14th floor. She's even been spotted floating outside on ledges, gazing longly at the city she loves so much, and the Japanese couple who walked in on her aren't the only people who have found her spending her afterlife haunting the hotel's rooms. Eugene Mensch, hotel van's bell captain, recalls the time one of his staff escorted some guests to room 1403. The people entered the room quickly and the door swung shut behind them, leaving the bellman alone in the hallway. Or so he thought. Suddenly, the lady in red flew toward the bellman, and passed straight through the door. He hurried inside to warn the guests that they were they were alone. But passed straight through the door. He hurried inside to warn the guests, but they were alone in the room. Jenny had vanished. Many movies and television shows have filmed scenes in the hotel van, including the X Files. The hotel's period charm perfectly suited the show's supernatural plotline 
and dark atmosphere. But had the production team known about the real ghost haunting the halls, they might have thought twice about filming there. A crew member worked on the show in the 90s, was setting up film equipment on the 14th floor when he was confronted, confronted by the lady in red. Leaving his equipment behind, he immediately vacated the hotel and refused to return to work there. Some believe that Jenny, who was an ama amateur stage actress, was curious about the production of the show. As terrifying as those sightings have been, the creepiest experience had taken place in and around the hotel's elevators. When the hotel was constructed in the 30s, not all of the shafts and elevators installed. There is a dummy shaft that only has doors on the 1st and 14th floors. These doors are bolted shut from the inside for safety, making them impossible to open. That hasn't stopped the red hasn't stopped the lady in red. Mench had reported that both a bellman and an assistant manager have seen the bolted doors open on their own, and it's not uncommon uncommon for people to see Jenny float in and out of the unfinished elevator. It's as if she's using it as her own personal elevator to and from her favorite room. More recently, security cameras have detected activity in one of the stairwells near the 14th floor. A staff member who prefers to remain anonymous reports the video footage confirms the existence of a ghost in the hotel van. The camera turns on automatically when someone passes in front of it, a security measure to alert the guards if someone tries to gain unauthorized access to the roof. Late one night, the camera turned on, but no one could be seen in the stairwell. However, the sound of footsteps could be heard slowly climbing the stairs toward the camera. Once the sound, once the sound was at its loudest, an odd shadow passed through the camera, and then shortly thereafter, a disembodied shriek filled the stairwell. The lady in red's afterlife activity has gained her a great deal of fame. Not only are spooky stories shared amongst employees and the many guests who have witnessed unexplainable events over the years, but the hotel's bar has honored her presence by naming a drink after her. And so, Jenny Pearl Cox has gained a certain amount of immortality in her beloved hotel. There's little doubt she would approve. Thank you for listening. If you like this type of content, please consider subscribing and liking to my channel, and I will see you on the next one.